The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a routine checkup. My heart sank. Reveals their child has a fatal condition. He was such a healthy baby and all of a sudden he's not. And mom's life is in jeopardy as well. And there's nothing I can do. One family clings to hope for the holidays. He said this baby is worth saving. And a miracle unfolds. I get to remember our savior who saved my son. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. The countdown to Christmas is on, and Democrats are in a mad rush to wrap up their plans to imp impeach the president before December 25th. Well, what surprise move did Chairman Jerry Nadler make yesterday? And are more Democrats now expected to defect to the other side? Here's Jennifer Wishon from Washington. After months of investigations and weeks of debate, it seems the number of Americans who either support or oppose the Democrats' push to impeach President Trump hasn't changed. Today, the House Judiciary Committee is working to advance articles of impeachment against the president. After like committee chairman it. Jerry Nadler abruptly postponed a committee vote late Thursday night the committee is in recess. to send the articles to a vote in the full House. That surprise move came after some 14 hours of often bitter partisan debate. We have an ongoing crime. We have a crime in progress. It's not just an attack on the presidency. It's an attack on us. It's an attack on those of us who believe in this president. This is a constitutional crime spree. That's why courage is so badly needed right here, right now. Our national security and democracy are depending on it. Although earlier this year, Speaker Pelosi said impeachment should be bipartisan, it appears that opposition to impeachment is what will have bipartisan support, with some House Democrats abandoning their own party. This impeachment is going to fail. The Democrats will pay a heavy political price for it. A number of Democrats serving in swing districts fear a vote for impeachment could cost them their seat. I made a commitment to my district uh, from the, the moment that this began that I'm going to focus on all the facts. Senior Democratic aides tell The Washington Post the number of Democrats defecting could range from two to possibly six or more. People have to come to their own conclusions. Even with defections, the House is all but certain to impeach the president, after which the Senate is expected to move quickly through its trial in the new year. And despite the president's call to subpoena high-profile witnesses like Joe and Hunter Hunter Biden, Senate Republicans may not call any witnesses. There's zero chance the president obviously would be removed from office. And that appears to be the way Americans want it. Voters still oppose impeachment by a slim majority, 50 to 45 percent. Americans in swing states are even more opposed to it. And get this, independent voters are strongly opposed to impeachment anywhere from 8 to 19 points. So despite their efforts, this hasn't been the home run Democrats hoped for. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Well, this has been political theater, and, and what's the casualty in this? I think the casualty is how seriously will, will the nation take future impeachments. Uh, if it's become political theater, if it's become partisan, uh, well, then it's not based on violations of the law. It's based on your political leanings of the moment. So given that, uh, the Senate is absolutely certain to not impeach. Will anyone take a, an impeachment inquiry in the, in the House of Representatives seriously in the future? Uh, and now what happens? The Trump administration is essentially ignoring what the House is doing. If the Senate says we're not even going to go through a trial on this, we're just going to take it to a vote, uh, well, now what happens? Um, and if is the House going to come up with new articles of impeachment? Are we going to see yet another attempt at impeachment uh, in 2020? Uh, this is, uh, again, political theater. No one is, seems to be understanding what this is doing to that process. What will it mean for future generations? If you have this kind of thing happening, and it seems to be purely based on partisanship. In other news, Britain will soon be leaving the European Union. Boris Johnson's conservative 
Party has won an overwhelming victory in the British elections. John Jessup has the story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. The Conservatives now have their biggest majority in Parliament since uh, Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. The win came after Prime Minister Boris Johnson campaigned relentlessly to make Brexit finally happen, following years of political fighting both before and after the 2016 British vote to pull out of the EU. This election means that getting Brexit done is now the irrefutable, irresistible, unarguable decision of the British people. Johnson added that leaving the EU by the end of January, the United Kingdom will be taking back control of its laws, borders, money, and immigration system. Well, here in Washington, sponsors of a new bill in Congress want a federal expansion of both religious freedom and LGBTQ rights. They call it fairness for all and say it's a better deal for people of faith than what they call the Radical Equality Act that the House passed last spring. Heather Sells brings us a look at the new proposal. The bill, known as Fairness for All, expands the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to include sexual orientation and gender identity. It also provides exemptions for religious liberty. And that's key for people of faith who have watched their protections decline while those for LGBTQ people have grown. In New York, wedding business owner Cynthia Gifford had to pay state fines after refusing a same-sex ceremony on her property. When the government tells you what to say and punishes you if you don't, is scary stuff. Christian colleges and universities have also faced a host of religious liberty battles, so they work to frame the bill. It's very important in America to be able to teach and to have policies that reflect a, a conservative, orthodox, orthodox, and historical position on marriage. And we want to make sure there's no penalty around those beliefs in the future. A small group of gay activists have also pursued the bill. They say it's a far better deal for people of faith than the Radical Equality Act, which House Democrats passed unanimously last spring. And eventually, both of these sides and both of these bills are going to have to start working together to find something that can actually pass both chambers of Congress and be signed by a president. The bill's Republican sponsor, Utah Representative Chris Stewart, says it's time for lawmakers to resolve the country's debate over religious liberty. I think it's better for us in society if the courts don't have to resolve these issues one at a time, often in conflicting findings and over many, many years that leads to uncertainty and in too many cases, strife and conflict. But conservatives at the Heritage Foundation and Alliance Defending Freedom say the religious liberty protections are weak and that elevating sexual orientation and gender identity to a protected class will harm liberty, privacy and safety. There are many of us who believe that this bill concedes far, far, far too much and undermines the interests of young people who are suffering from gender dysphoria, well, of their parents, of women and girls who want to compete on an equal playing field in athletics. Those backing fairness for all say people of faith need an alternative to the Equality Act, which most believe would severely threaten religious liberty. They believe fairness for all could lead to a long-term discussion and solution with the LGBTQ community. Heather Sell, CBN News. Thank you, Heather. A few months ago, the community of Virginia Beach came together to raise money for the families of the victims of the mass shooting that killed 11 city employees and a local contractor and wounded four others. CBN contributed to the fund thanks to generous donations from viewers like you. And Congress just passed legislation to make sure those gifts are tax deductible. Here's Abigail Robertson with that story. As many different families prepare to spend their first Christmas missing loved ones lost in Virginia Beach's tragic shooting last May, Congress is giving them a gift by passing a bill to help provide financial relief to the victims' families. The incredible thing that happened was the outpouring not only from Virginia Beach, but from across the Commonwealth. About $4.5 million was raised in the aftermath of the shooting to help fund funeral costs and other financial needs. But Senator Mark Warner tells CBN News there was a small problem. The folks who originally set up this very worthy foundation, by the nature of naming the actual beneficiaries, which would be the families 
of the f folks who were who were killed, that it violated certain IRS rules. The recently passed Virginia Beach Strong Act helps ease the tax burden on both donors and recipients. The close to four and a half million dollars will now get the full tax deductibility status that it deserves. Warner says in the future, he hopes there will be more bipartisan legislation to address gun violence. I do think no matter you know, where people fall on the political spectrum, we ought to find at least some common areas to come together. So if we can even just prevent one of these tragedies uh, in, in the future, I think we'll have taken a small step forward. With the bill passed in both the House and Senate, Warner says he's hopeful President Trump will sign it into law by Christmas. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abby. And Gordon, that would make a pretty good Christmas gift. It would make a fantastic Christmas gift. I encourage the president to sign it. Also, thanks to Senator Warner uh, and his office for taking the lead on getting this bill passed. I do wish there were a broader bill, and the broader bill would allow uh, help going to the victims of so many tragic shootings that we've had in America. The problem was the local United Way set up the, 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 this fund uh, literally within hours of the, the shooting and, and named a specific class of beneficiaries. Uh, under IRS rules, uh, you can't name a specific class. It has to be a general class. Uh, and when you start getting specific, that puts the tax deduction at, at risk. Uh, Congress needs to cut, step up and say, uh, we want to help the victims of these shootings. And we want to assure donors that their gift is going specifically to the victims of the shooting. That's the intent. Uh, these gifts should be tax deductible, and, and this obscurity in the IRS rules needs to be dealt with. And, and what we've had is a whole patchwork of various bills uh, to claim exemptions for various shootings. This shouldn't happen. It shouldn't have to require an act of Congress. It should be uh, these things are tax deductible. If an existing 501c3 organization creates a special designated fund for victims of any disaster, and whether that's a home fire or a shooting, uh, anything that has a narrow class of beneficiaries, then those gifts should be tax deductible, and it should be specific to the victims of that tragedy. Uh, so I encourage them, let's take a look at this and a bipartisan look at this and say, how can we make this happen? How can we move forward? Well, this coming March, CBN Films is bringing you the epic story of St. Patrick. This new movie was filmed on location in Ireland, and it features Lord of the Rings actor John Reese davies Here's a look at the trailer. It was not my grace, but God, who conquered in me and who resisted them all, that I might come to the Irish nations to preach the gospel. The preconception that we've got about St. Patrick is completely wrong. Ireland was a place of barbarians at the end of the world. Get going, boy. It is slavery for life. Patrick, you are to travel to your homeland. To hear the call to go back to Ireland terrified him. It was asking a lot of this man to do this. This does not have to be, Patrick. It is the will of God. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Who among you heeds the call? Why would this man put himself in danger among enemies who do not know God? People thought that this mission was crazy, that his efforts to Christianize Ireland were doomed to failure. Tell us the secret you know about Patrick. Things in the past can come back to haunt us.
take him. Now it's time to go. I'm not finished. No! This movie is coming out March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Why are we doing a film on St. Patrick? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, he was one of the greatest missionaries of all time, and his methods still work today. He would go to the villages in Ireland. He wouldn't talk to them in Latin. He would talk to them in their language. He would preach the gospel in their language. And then another wonderful thing he did, he wouldn't uh, impose foreign priests over them. He would select from his converts a priest to lead that congregation. Uh, for that, he got in trouble with the church. Uh, but he got a lot of favor with God, and he established monasteries that sent missionaries, that developed learning. Uh, if you're uh, from Scotland, if you're from Ireland, you owe your salvation to St. Patrick. It's the missionaries he inspired that then went to Scotland to convert that nation uh, and then preserved the gospel and preserved the text. Uh, the monasteries were famous for their uh, copying of the texts of the Old and New Testament. Here's another thing and, and why he's so important. It's the first time in history anyone wrote down a stance against slavery. And it was because of his life. He had been captured and taken as a slave. And then he found that people from Britain were taking his recent converts. He took a stand against slavery. He took a stand against sex trafficking. And so his voice still speaks today. If you'd like to attend the meeting, we've got a special website for you, IamPatrick.com. And here's what we need. We need to have some pre-sales of the tickets for this movie. I know it's a long time between now and March 17th, but if you can go to IamPatrick.com, buy your tickets now. They'll make a very special Christmas gift, a wonderful stocking stuffer for people. Uh, I hope it inspires a whole new generation of missionaries, a whole new generation that will take up the banner of St. Patrick. You can find out more how you can buy a ticket. You'll help us get more theaters. You'll help us get more screening dates if you do it now and do it before Christmas. Uh, so do it. Go to IamPatrick.com. There's a place there that will link you to the Fathom website, theater websites, where you can buy a ticket in your town. Right now we're in over 900 theaters. Uh, we want to take that up and really cover uh, North America with this wonderful message of this great missionary uh, and how he changed a nation. Terry? Well, still ahead, seven months pregnant and told to get ready for a funeral. What did this young mother and her husband do? And how did it lead to a miracle on Christmas Eve? But first, a dire warning from a former terrorist and member of the Ku Klux Klan. Where does he see America headed? And how is the internet leading the way? Find out after this. A terrorist sentenced to 30 years for planting a bomb at the home of a civil rights leader back in 1968. So what does this former Ku Klux Klan member have to say about the hatred and violence in America today? And who does he insist must confront it? Take a look. I heard lots of sermons. I went to Sunday school regularly. Um, I even made a profession of faith when I was 13 years old. Listening to Tom Terrence, it's hard to imagine the soft-spoken preacher once served time in prison and survived four gunshot wounds in an FBI shootout before landing a 30-year sentence for planting a bomb at the home of the civil rights leader in 1968. I hated uh, black people, I hated Jews, I hated liberals, and on and on. That hatred eventually drew him to the Ku Klux Klan. My school had been selected for um, desegregation, and um, I became very angry about it. In prison, Tom began a search for truth and deeper meaning that ultimately led him to the Bible. He became a Christian and acknowledged his sordid past. 
I certainly deserved to die. I had deserved to go to hell for my sins. But in his great mercy, God spared my life. Tom's faith grew with the help of prominent Christians like Billy Graham and Chuck Colson, founder of Prison Fellowship. He abandoned his racist ideology, and after an unexpected early prison release, Tom saw an amazing turnaround, eventually co-pastoring a multi-ethnic church in Washington, D.C., and leading a global ministry devoted to making Christian disciples. It's not impossible for people who hold some basic Christian beliefs to embrace this kind of extremist narrative that I did. Now, some 50 years later, Tom sees another cultural collision facing America. He reveals similarities between then and now in his new book, Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love. I saw all of this as um, a kind of war, fighting for God and country. A viewpoint still evident today. Jews will not replace us! He points to April's deadly shooting at a California synagogue as an example of white nationalism growing on the internet and how it's worked its way onto college campuses and even inside some churches. A young man raised in a Presbyterian church, Orthodox Presbyterian church, I should say, fell into this type of thinking and put them together and then went and shot up a synagogue. He calls on churches to confront this evil and believes the key to change is at the core of true Christian values. Just teach the Bible. Teach what Jesus taught uh, about loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and loving your neighbor. All the different races and ethnicities and uh, political perspectives. Um, we're called to love one another. A message and a calling he says is more urgent now than ever. John Jessup, CBN News, Washington. Now we're called to love one another. We're called to love the stranger in our midst. We're called to love our enemies. Uh, but let me underline this. There is no room in Christianity for anti-Semitism. Uh, realize that Christianity is a Jewish religion. Our Savior was born a Jew. Every single book in the New Testament was written by a Jew. And when you get that and you understand that, well, we're grafted into them. Uh, we're grafted into what God gave to Abraham and how God was going to bless every nation on the, on the face of the earth uh, through him. Uh, this is the fulfillment of it. There's no room at all for anti-Semitism in that. There's no room at all for white supremacy or any kind of racial supremacy. When you look at the book of Revelation, who stands before the throne? Every tribe, every nation, every tongue. Uh, we'll all be one then. Uh, so why don't we do that here on earth? Why don't we have God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven? The name of the book is called Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love, and you can find it wherever books are sold. Terry? Well, still ahead, a nightmare scenario, getting four young boys ready for bed. But no problem for this mom. What's her secret? Stay tuned to find out. <clears throat> but first, Christmas is all about a miracle birth, and boy, have we got one for you. A baby who was supposed to be buried at birth. What happened instead? A Christmas Eve miracle. Well, this is our weekend for the Christmas Village. It'll be open tonight, 6 to 9 p.m., uh, and then tomorrow from noon to 9 p.m. So if you're in the 75 area code or nearby, uh, come see us. And let me underline, it is free and open to the public. Uh, you may have to pay for your fire roasted brat, but you've, the food the food will cost. We got oh, some free it. cider for you and some <laughs> free cookies, uh, but it'll be fun for the whole family, and your whole family will be able to see the live nativity scene every 30 minutes. We're going to be uh, telling the story of the nativity uh, with live actors, uh, live animals. It's all going to be wonderful. It's a great thing for you, your whole family. So come on out. 
6 to 9 o'clock tonight, not, uh, noon to 9 p.m. tomorrow on Saturday, uh, and be a part of it. Enjoy it. You'll be glad you did. It's very magically beautiful. <laughs> well, prepare yourselves for a funeral. That's what doctors told Christy and Jonas Diener. They also said their unborn baby would never survive delivery and that Christy's life was in jeopardy as well. But the doctors were dead wrong. When newlyweds Christy and Jonas Diener found out they were expecting their first child, they were elated. We prayed and we asked um, God what, what we should name our son. And um, we both um, came across the name David. It meant beloved. Baby David was expected to arrive just in time for Christmas 2013. The idea of having a son um, was so exciting for us. The first months of my pregnancy were textbook. Um, easy breezy and just a lot of fun. But before her routine checkup at seven months, Christy noticed the baby wasn't moving around as much as usual. She was given an ultrasound and the couple was sent to a waiting room for results. My heart sank. I just knew something was wrong. The diagnosis was serious. Baby David had fetal high drops, a condition in which fluid was surrounding his abdomen, lungs, and heart. Only 20% of babies with the condition survived delivery. I felt discouraged because he was such a healthy baby and all of a sudden he's not, and there's nothing I can do. They rushed to see a specialist where David was also diagnosed with SVT. His heart rate was irregular and reaching a life-threatening 280 beats per minute. Christy was admitted to the hospital for treatment and close monitoring. It almost sounded like a helicopter. It was going so fast. And we'd pray as soon as it jumped back into the high rhythm, we'd pray for it to go back lower. And I couldn't sleep, I couldn't rest, I couldn't do anything but just sit there and pray, Lord, convert his heart rate. Five days later, baby David was then diagnosed with a disease that elongated his heart muscle called restrictive cardiomyopathy. The doctor said in a matter of days, Christy would have an early labor and the baby would not survive. Christy was also at risk for mirroring syndrome, a condition in which her heart could fail along with her son's. And so Jonas, the first thing that he did was he started to pray. And the first words out of his mouth were, God, you are good. And so that's what we had to cling to was, God, you're good despite our circumstances. Doctors said there was nothing more they could do. They stopped Christie's medication and released her. David was not expected to survive the weekend. The anticipation of delivery passed as the couple began to plan for their baby's death. And so Jonas um, called a funeral home and um, was ordering a casket, but we still clung to hope. We knew that God was big enough to heal our son. The question is, is he gonna heal him with a miracle or is he gonna heal him through death? And so every time he kicked, I had no clue if it was gonna be the last. As Christy and Jonas looked to God for strength, family and friends held on to hope. We would send out updates on, you know, baby Diener and, you know, the prognosis and people would share it. And I would get countless, you know, Facebook messages or emails or text messages saying, hey, my church is praying for you. Even when my wife and I couldn't um, say anything or do anything, um, there were people all around us who were praying and we felt those prayers from um, all around the world. At each checkup, David's condition had worsened but he was still alive. With each appointment, they were surprised that he was still alive. They've never seen a baby with this much fluid that wasn't a stillborn. Nearly two weeks after the Deaners were first told their child would not live, at Christie's 23rd week appointment, the ultrasound technician was astonished. I didn't even want to look at the screen because I was preparing my heart to deliver a baby that wasn't alive. And she kept on asking me, what's your name? What's your date of birth? When's the due date? And she said, I have to go get the doctor. Dr. Moise uh, looked at us and he said, divine intervention, that there was something that had happened outside of their control, even though they had stopped treating David medically, that the fluid around his head, heart, and lungs had started to dramatically disappear. He said, this baby is worth saving. I was like, really? He's healed? Really? December and Christmas was coming, and so was our son. The prayers didn't stop, and day by day, David's health improved. At 32 weeks, there was no more fluid around his abdomen. And his heart even changed shape. It was no longer elongated. It was what a normal baby's heart should look like. 
I'm a nurse, and so I know that him having this miraculous thing done, it could only point to, to God. On Christmas Eve 2013, the couple received the gift they had been praying for. David William Diener was born. Just the joy in Jonas and I's heart, we were ecstatic. After only 18 hours in the NICU, Christy and Jonas were able to bring David home. Walking him through the door and just being like, we're home now and we're a family. Today, David is healthy and his development is right on track. These days, he's busy being a big brother. Christy was able to have more children. He loves his little sisters, Anna and Beth, and he'd do anything for them. He loves dinosaurs and loves Mickey Mouse and loves Christmas. So Christmas Eve will always be really special in my heart because I get to remember, you know, our Savior who saved my son. David wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God intervening through prayer, and um, prayer has everything to do with why David's here today. Merry Christmas! That is a miracle, and I hope it gives hope to those of you who are uh, getting bad reports or simply overwhelmed with your circumstances. God is able. He is good. I, what she said was so powerful about, you know, this baby could be healed either way, through a miracle or healed through death. Which is an amazing statement oh, of faith. Goodness, yeah. Uh, that, that, yes, in heaven there's no more tears, there's no more sickness. And so if, if God takes him to heaven, then I know he's healed there. What an amazing statement of faith. And let that be your confession of mm -hmm. faith. Uh, Lord, I believe in you. I trust you. You know, so often when these things happen, and that couple could have done this, they could have said, you know, why is this happening to me? You know, we're, we're living life right. Uh, everything's great. We're caring for other people. Uh, why, why is this happening to, to us? They didn't do that. They didn't complain. What they said is, God, we trust you. And you can heal our child here, or you can heal our child in heaven. Either way, it's okay with us. What an amazing thing. Let that be your prayer. Lord, I trust you. I abandon myself to you. No longer my will be done, your will be done. I trust your will. It will be perfect, and you will work all things together for my good. I trust you. I believe in you. We're going to pray. Before we pray, we've got some prayer requests that have been written into us. Here's one to be healed from depression and schizophrenia. Here's one to be delivered of new age and Hindu beliefs. What do you have? I have someone saying I need to be healed of severe, severe bone infection, pleased to be healed of kidney problems and bladder cancer, and that my elderly parents would accept Jesus. And I would just like to add Heather, a friend who has... Um, metastatic bone cancer and needs prayer. All right. Lord, we just lift up Heather to you. Yes. And we, we rebuke cancer Amen. in Jesus' name. Yes, cancer is illegal in the kingdom of heaven, and so we just declare that over Heather's body and every, every bone cell, every bone in her body. Lord, you speak health to all our bones, and we speak health to Heather right now. Be delivered of this and be healed now in Jesus' name. For those who have written in, for those who have depression, Lord God, give them your light. Give them joy, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Lord, pour out your compassion over them. Let them know for anyone who is not in their right mind, you restore sound minds. Thank you. That is your will. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but a sound mind. Lord, let there be sound minds in your body today. That is your will. And so we receive it right now. For anyone struggling with unbelief, for anyone struggling with new age or any other thing that is not part of you, Lord God, we just rebuke all of those thoughts, all of those ways right now, all of those rituals. In Jesus' name, be delivered of that so that your conscience may be clear to serve the living God. Terry, God's spoken to you. Lord, I just pray that there would be peace in families this Christmas. There are some of you who are just in families that are so troubled. And God, I just ask you that the peace of God, that your sweet spirit would come and breathe life into families now that are struggling together. Lord, 
let your peace reign on earth. Mm -hmm. We pray for our nation. We pray for our president. We pray for our senators. Yes. We pray for every member of the House of Representatives. Lord God, let us be one nation, mm -hmm. indivisible. Speak peace, Lord God. Yes. Let there be peace on earth and goodwill yes. towards men. We receive it, Lord, mm -hmm. because we pray it in your name. Amen. amen and amen. If you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is call us 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, coming up later, are you longing to hear from God? Well, listen up. Author and Pastor Jane Hammond joins us live to talk about hearing the voice of God and understanding what you hear. You don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN Newsbreak. Israeli police are now allowing Jewish groups to pray on the Temple Mount, according to the Jerusalem Post. That would change what's called the status quo agreement between Israel's government and the Islamic group that controls daily activities at the location where the first and second Jewish temples stood in biblical times. The status quo agreement does not allow non-Muslims to pray on the Temple Mount. An official said he was unaware of any change, but warned that any change could lead to a strong reaction from Arabs and Muslims. Some Jews and Christians believe a third temple will be built on the Temple Mount before the coming of the Messiah. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping a domestic violence victim in El Salvador get a fresh start. Iris is a mother of two who suffered violent attacks from her ex-husband, who often beat and verbally assaulted her in front of the children. Iris finally ran away with the kids to start a better life, but she often struggled to put food on the table as she and the children went hungry. Then Operation Blessing gave Iris a new micro enterprise selling vegetables and french fries. Iris and her children now have a safe, stable new life. Operation Blessing and its faithful partners are providing livelihoods for struggling families in El Salvador and all over the world. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more Today's 700 Club right after this. Jason and Rachel need all the help they can raising four boys, especially at bedtime. And that's why they like Superbook so much. At the end of a long day, the whole family winds down with a Superbook episode. And guess who gets to choose the episode? Take a look. Jason and Rachel Oyer have four boys, so life happens at warp speed. But there's one thing that Samuel, Levi, Benjamin, and Matt will sit still for. Superbook. They're the ones who are like, we love Superbook. It's awesome. Bedtime routine can definitely be crazy at times, but one thing that uh, we had been doing for a while is who's ever, you know, brush their teeth and put their pajamas on, taking their shower, the first one down would be able to pick the Superbook uh, episode. We could just unwind all together from crazy. I want to end the day well with my kids. This is the last thing they're going to think about before they go to sleep. The boys, ranging in age from four to 10, are eager to tell you about their favorite episodes. I'll tell about a lot about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. They're all the rest of the prophets were worshiping Baal, but Elijah, he was trying to make everyone worship to God. God made a fiery pit and they blasted wide open. It was super good. I learned that God loves us so much. It also makes me feel like I want to be a missionary when I grow up because of all the people that don't know God. Rachel homeschools all of her sons, and Superbook is a vital tool for teaching them life-changing spiritual principles. It's something that can change their daily life. You want them to be able to stand up to peer pressure and not give in to something you know is a bad choice for them. When difficult things happen, to be able to push through and not to give up. Superbook brings all those things together. It's just nice to have somebody on your team with you who wants you to succeed. They want you to raise your children to know Christ. 
And we want children all over the world to know Christ. We're now in over 52 languages. We're preaching the gospel through Superbook. And it's a great gospel uh, presentation. It's a great evangelistic tool. It's also a great discipleship tool. And here's the best part. You can be part of it. You can be a part of not just helping your own family, but helping families around the world. How? Join the Superbook DVD Club. Now, we've got a special offer for you right now because it's Christmas coming up. We've got The Promise of a Child. It's a wonderful Christmas episode. And if you're a member of the Superbook Club, you'll get not only one copy, you'll get three copies for a gift of $25 or more. When you join the club, that means you'll be first in line to get new Superbook episodes as we finish out season five, you'll be the first to get not one copy, you'll get three copies for a recurring gift of $25. So if that's you, if you want to be a part of it, be a part of the production cost, translation cost, distribution cost, join the Superbook DVD Club. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, up next, if you're a believer, God is speaking to you. But can you hear him? And do you understand what he's saying? Author and Pastor Jane Hammond talks about the power of discernment after this. Well, how do you hear the voice of God? Well, that's a question we often get in our email box. People want God to speak to them, and they want to be able to discern His will for their lives. Take a look. Prophetic leader Jane Hammond and her husband Tom pastor Vision Church at Christian International in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. For more than 30 years, they've invested in people and building the kingdom. Jane says we are living in such critical times that it's important for you to walk in greater spiritual authority by learning to discern God's voice. In her book, Discernment, Jane draws from scripture and personal experience as she teaches how to navigate life with victory as you learn to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. Well, please welcome back to the 700 Club, our dear friend, Jane Hammond. Jane, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Gordon. It's yeah. good to be with you. All right, let's get right into it because I hear this a lot. Okay. You know, how do you hear the voice of God? I, I, I don't know how or I don't hear his voice. And then you get, well, if I do start hearing voices, that mean I'm going crazy. Right. What, 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 how, how do you do this? How do you get into it? Well, it's interesting. In uh, Psalms 85, verse 8, it actually says, I will hear what the Lord God will speak. Mm. And when I began to study that, it's a very interesting Hebrew word. It's the word Shema. And Shema means to discern, but it also means to listen intentionally and to hear intelligently. And so I think sometimes we think we don't hear God's voice, but do we actually take time to listen intentionally to hear what it is that he's saying? Prayer should be not just a one-way street, but a two-way street where we talk and then we listen. Yeah, and I think that's part of the Greek. They, there's a, a dia in there, which is also the Greek word for a two-way street. It's, that's right. it's, it's a way. That's right. Um, what should we be expecting when we're looking for it? Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, it's been my experience. God speaks in a variety of ways. He does. And it really, really got me when I found out that God could speak to me through my wife. That was a strange <laughs> one. And then God could speak to me through my parents. And then he started speaking through me, to me through my children. And that was, you know... I, how, how, how many different ways does God have to speak? Well, I think that it's infinite. I think that as we have spent the last 35, 40 years activating people to hear the voice of God, I think that there's three primary ways that people tend to hear God's voice. Mm -hmm. they, see, they either hear something um, audibly, and I don't always mean just like in their natural ears, but in the ear of their spirit. They may hear words. They may see pictures or they may actually get a sense or a feeling. So seeing, hearing, sensing, or feeling, I think are some of the initial indicators of how God speaks. Of course, I love the fact that God speaks in dreams, God speaks in visions, God speaks through others. God obviously speaks through his word when it jumps off the page and becomes revelation to us. How do you test it to how do you know test it? that it is God and it's not just yourself, it's not just your own self-talk but this is really God, and how do you know? I, I think that that's a very important thing. I think that we've got to understand in Ephesians 1.17, it says, may God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And so the number one thing is, is that we've got to go back to the word of God. We've got to find out, number one, is what we're hearing biblically, biblical? Is it, uh, is it consistent with what God is saying? Is it 
what God is saying to your life for this season of time? And can you actually submit it to other people and get their input? Because through the multitude of counselors, there's always safety. Yeah, get two or three witnesses. That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> get confirmation. That's exactly right, yes. Uh, particularly if... And we have horror stories of people that don't do that. Right. And, you know, people that, that just get, get a, what we call a vision. You know, <laughs> wishful thinking and, and calling it God. <laughs> Well, what do you do with them? Because I think that's, um, how do you restore that? Because I, I run into that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I got this word or I did this mm -hmm. and now I don't trust anything anymore. How do you restore? My, my father-in-law, Dr. Bill Hammond, does a great teaching. He says that we've got to get the word, the will, and the way. And so what we've got to do is we've got to find out, is it the word of God? Is it God's will for our life? And is it the way? And t typically what happens is that well-meaning Christians usually miss it somewhere along the way. They find out that it is in the word, it is God's will, but the way is God's timing, how the money's coming, the partnerships that need to take place. And so just perhaps maybe people that are watching today maybe have made some mistakes in, in implementing the way of the Lord in bringing the word of the Lord to pass. Um, my encouragement to them would be, Forgive yourself for what the mistakes that you've made in the past, and let's hear the voice of God, and let's do it again. All right. Well, let's turn to your book, Discernment, because I think um, this is absolutely needed. Uh, there are books on prophecy. There are books mm -hmm. on word of knowledge, healing, mm -hmm. uh, but the discerning of spirits, and that's a specific gift that you it's were true. given. It was actually yes. prophesied over you yes, that you was. would have this. Um, how did it first manifest for you? Well, I think that from the beginning of my prophetic journey, um, I would have different sensings. I, I, I actually, as a child, I actually saw demonic things um, in my room even before I was saved. Um, I became very aware of the angelic realm, demons and angels is a, is, is a part of, of discerning, understanding what's taking place in the spirit realm around us. But then I would also begin to understand that there would be times that I would interact with people and people that seem to have everything together and something inside of me would say, mm, everything is not as it seems. And I would think I was just being critical or judgmental. Um, and, and, so, and so I was taught, if you can't say something nice, then don't say anything at all. And so I never really said anything to anybody about what I was sensing or picking up in the spirit. And uh, until we started having some different things happen and my father-in-law would say, well, why didn't you say something? And so I had to learn how to process this gift with wisdom and revelation um, so that I didn't shoot them all and tell God they died, okay, <laughs> and make sure, that, make sure that I was walking in love, right. making sure that I was walking in the Spirit of God, because it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Gifts are given to build, not to tear down, but they're also given as a protect protection for yeah. the body of Christ. And you need to add the gift of wisdom Absolutely. to the gift of discernment Absolutely. and how to do it so you're not tearing down That's and you exactly are right. Building up mm -hmm. uh, for you, how, how did it manifest? You'd get this sick feeling in your stomach. You'd... Uh, it, depending on what it was that mm -hmm. I was picking up on, uh, so, so if something was unclean or um, out of order, sometimes it would be a, a, a sick feeling. Sometimes it would be just a very uncomfortable feeling, um, where I, I, it's, like, it's like I could kind of see the motive behind the the smile, yeah. if you will. Um, and I just had to learn how to process that with love and with prayer um, and also understand that I had the freedom to talk to my spiritual leaders about the things that I was picking up. Um, God gave me two of the most mercy motivated men, uh, my father-in-law and my husband, to, to help me grow in this gift. And uh, at one point, because it had been prophesied over me, Bishop Hammond laid hands on me and activated this gift to, to a full function. And then it was like I went to church and it was literally like a veil had been pulled back and I saw everything and heard conversations and saw all kinds of, and I went back to him and I said, you put your hands back on me and take this gift back. I don't yeah, want this much. operating in my life. Because, let's get granular because the discernment is thoughts. Mm -hmm. intentions, That's exactly motivations, right. mm -hmm. as well as angels, mm -hmm. as well as the demonic. Mm -hmm. And when you open yourself to that, it can actually get uncomfortable to be around certain people mm -hmm. because you're going, wait a minute, this, right. what you're telling me is not really what's in your heart. Right. And so what I've had to learn to do is I've had to learn how to utilize this gift to bring people into freedom. 
because that's what the gifts are given to do, to, mm -hmm. to give people an opportunity to choose freedom, right. to choose life. And also, if somebody is actually a wolf in sheep's clothing, to know that and be able to, again, give them a yeah. choice to, for freedom, and then if not, then to protect the body. And then a choice to protect the flock. A, a choice uh, to protect the flock. And the Holy Spirit will always That's help you right. with that. That's well, right. Well, Jane's latest book is called Discernment, The Essential Guide to Hearing the Voice of God. It's available wherever books are sold. Here's a scripture for you from Amos. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. For all of us here, Merry Christmas. We'll see you again. God bless.